Uh, hello, I'm Don Janelle, and I'm uh, delighted to be here for the Time and Time Flow debates uh, to share some uh, ideas about a time-space geographical perspective on human settlement systems. Um, so I'm not a physicist, I'm a geographer, and but nonetheless, I believe we do share some things uh, in common, and some of those will be hopefully brought out uh, in the uh, presentation and in the discussion uh, that follows. So, settlement systems. This is something I've always been interested in, as a, from the time I was a young kid. Uh, but, uh, Walter Kristaller, a very noted German geographer of the 1920s through the, about the 1970s, I believe, um, uh, is, is probably the preeminent person with respect to enunciating a theory of settlement systems. He advanced the concept of central places and based it on his work in southern Germany. And this is a map that uh, he um, included within his book. It's actually an embellishment of the map, but the original map that he included in his work in 1933. And we'll just blow it up a little bit here and see uh, what this entails. Uh, so it represents a significant amount of field research that he did within southern Germany. Uh, and you can see familiar names of places. And the towns are ordered by size, represented by the symbology, with uh, Munich, of course, being a higher-ordered place than Nuremberg. Uh, and then many small villages and hamlets that uh, uh, represent the, the landscape. And the lines that uh, you see there represent his uh, evidence of trade area boundaries that surround these villages and towns and cities. And uh, some of them, uh, for example, uh, uh, Nuremberg has a much larger profile uh, represented by these larger lines than some of the uh, smaller places on the map. So this was the empirical evidence. And Kristaller's work represents a rather interesting combination of inductive and deductive uh, reasoning. And uh, the... Whoops, sorry about that. <laughs> and um, But a settlement system, to begin with, is an integrated set of functionally related places where people live and carry out economic, social, and other activities. And so this is illustrated on the map and by some of the symbology that he includes with respect to uh, the level of the order of a place within the settlement system. And so the places range from large regional centers to small villages and hamlets, and at the continental and global scale, they reflect national centers, major urban agglomerations, and world cities, which uh, exercise uh, control functions over the uh, regional and global economies. So, um, in the, the work was originally in German, and it was translated by Baskin as part of a PhD thesis at the University of Virginia in the 1950s. Uh, in the discipline of economics. But Cristallo regarded himself as a geographer, even though he himself was trained as, a, as a, an economist. In 1966, uh, Baskin's translation of Cristallo was published uh, in English. And one of the notable features of this um, book uh, by Cristallo is the very first sentence on the very first page. It says, are there laws which determine the number, sizes, and distributions of towns? This is a rather profound question, uh, especially in geography in that particular era of the 1930s. Uh, this was a breakthrough moment. And Cristala's work has gone on to become probably the font of thousands and thousands of research papers uh, completed all around the world, trying to uh, evaluate uh, his uh, theory of settlement systems. So the image on the front of the cover of this book sort of captures some of the essence of his 
objective. He proposed a central place theory which set up an idealized nested hierarchy of places in the areas they served in distributing goods and services to the surrounding uh, populations. And the model reflects certain behavioral rules. For example, the behavioral rule for the merchants who are located at these town centers uh, is to earn a sufficient profit uh, in order for them to survive as a entity, an economic entity. And for the uh, consumers of goods and services, their objective is to attain what they need for a satisfactory lifestyle and for basic necessities with a minimum amount of effort. Uh, and so the the model is uh, is enunciated with respect to a isotropic plane, a perfectly flat space where transportation costs are equal in all directions, uh, and where the population is uniformly distributed with clusters at the nodes that you see on this map. And we won't go into the full details of the geometry of this system, but Cristola's book is definitely uh, an exciting uh, read, or at least it was for me when I was a early graduate student back in the 19, early 1960s. One of the uh, features, however, uh, about the Cristola model is that time and change over time are not considered in the model in any explicit way. It is considered somewhat implicitly in the sense that the distribution of towns and villages uh, does rely on the mode of transportation, which in the foundation days of these settlements in southern Germany uh, would have probably involved a walking or a beast of burden uh, carrying goods from one place to another. So, they're not considered in the model, and the model itself reflects a decision, decision making, if you will, by consumers and merchants in a largely, uh, purely spatial context. So, as I say, this has become a foundation concept for much of economic geography, for marketing, for a whole host of, uh, uh, disciplines that are concerned with, uh, planning. Uh, and uh, the uh, functioning of a uh, settlement system. And so this excited me, and uh, I decided I would explore this as a possible PhD thesis back in the uh, 1960s. And I began reading it somewhat more broadly, and I encountered uh, a number of works in physics that struck my attention, one of them being uh, a book uh, published after his death, Percy Williams Bridgman, uh, in 19, was published in 1963. There were actually multiple publications of this book that appeared in quick succession by different publishing houses. Um, but uh, Bridgman, as you can see, was a physicist. And um, this uh, gave me a new perspective on looking at settlement systems. This was not his topic, of course. But... Very early in the book, he makes mention of the fact that distance is not a sufficient parameter for describing relationships among points, events, or particles in space. Furthermore, he goes on to point out that one must know their positions in time and space, their velocities and directions of movement. Now, this posed a bit of a challenging challenge for me. Velocity, in this case, refers to the time rate at which the distance of separation between points, events, or particles change. Uh, now, I was working with a settlement system, and I was looking at a map. And if you look at a map, and I'm sure everyone has, you realize that these points on the map are static. They're not moving. A town is where it is. And so, velocity and direction in the human settlement system um, I was trying to grapple with this and uh, began raising a number of questions. Does the position of a place change over historical time? Okay. Uh, if so, why? How fast is it moving and where is it going? 
Is this true for all places? Do they all move at the same rate or various rates? What are the characteristics of place movement and velocity over historical time for any pair or set of places? And are these movements uniform across the hierarchy of places? So I'm trying to tie in this notion of places that are moving around in time space with the concept of the settlement system. And so this raises a question. How would we document such a dynamic view of the settlement system? So what data would be needed? What conceptualizations? What measurements? Can all of this be illustrated on a map? Or does it go beyond the map? And so here are some possibilities that were considered. Scaling the maps by travel time and cost measures instead of kilometers and miles. Cost, how much it costs to go from one place to another per kilometer, let's say, and travel time represent measures of effort in overcoming distance. So it's, it seems like a logical way to begin. The data from the historical record from public transportation schedules would provide some information about how long it takes and how much it may cost to go from one place to another within the urban system, in the, in the settlement system. And also it would be possible to model changes in travel time uh, through an understanding of transport history and the transition in uh, transport network technologies. And so these are some of the things that we'll be considering, considering uh, in this uh, session. So I began uh, gathering data and uh, enunciated a notion called time-space convergence. And so time-space convergence represents the speed at which one place converges upon another place, or they converge upon one another, uh, in a time space. And so here we have the minutes of separation between two places uh, extended over a period from 1658 to roughly 1966. And you can see the transition in uh, technologies from stagecoaches to railways uh, to the automobile and the airplane by the mid-1960s. So the convergence rates are rather phenomenal when you think about them. Edinburgh and London converging at 60 minutes per year over the entire time slice by land means of travel. If you throw in uh, airlines uh, in the uh, latter half of the 20th uh, uh, century, uh, they're converging at 29 minutes per year. And if you looked at only the railway era, uh, from 1850 to through 1966, they were converging at 3.4 minutes per year on average. Now, this uh, curve, the convergence curve, uh, is generally speaking asymptotic with respect to some uh, minimum level of separation between any two pair, uh, any pair of points uh, within a settlement system. And if we looked at other places, such as New York City and Boston, um, and we would see a similar kind of pattern. The curve looks very similar to the one for London. Um, and the convergence rates vary depending on what slice along that curve you take, or what slice of historical time you look at. And so in the stagecoach era, they were converging on an average of 80 minutes per year. And in the automobile, Built the automobile era from 1920 to 2010, the convergence rate works out to 1.2 minutes per year. Quite phenomenal, actually, is the evidence for the stagecoach, because the stagecoach was a very short-lived technology in transportation history. A matter of uh, a few uh, decades um, of, of time. And uh, yet, it resulted in significant innovations in technology that um, uh, resulted in rather rapid changes in the connectivity among settlements. This is a look at uh, 
the major cities within five different uh, national realms, uh, China, India, uh, Russia and the Soviet Union, uh, the United Kingdom and the United States, looking at two significant cities in each of these countries and look at their, looking at their convergence curves. And one of the things that stands out here immediately is the significant degree to which uh, China has emerged with a very steep convergence curve uh, through the period to 2010. So it's evident that China has a clear conception of how internal accessibility within a country influences their ability to become a player on the global scene in terms of uh, the uh, market economy. And this is played out in all of these uh, examples, but uh, quite quite dramatic in the Chinese case, uh, uh, given the uh, shorter history of railway uh, transportation and the rapidity with which uh, they have uh, advanced in this area. Now, uh, when looking at the convergence curve, it's possible to see three different uh, approaches, or these are the ones that that I've tried to focus on. Looking at the, the convergence curve as illustrated by a, a best-fitting line, if you will, between uh, points to which data are available, uh, and the calculation of the uh, convergence rate. Um, the second one is uh, simply a linear a rate over an extended period period of time. Um, and the third one is rather interesting, C, model C, in that uh, it represents probably a, a somewhat more empirical interpretation of what is actually happening. And that is to say that uh, convergence occurs generally over time. Um, that's the general pattern of uh, succession of transport technology, uh, but it is subject to deterioration, uh, to congestion factors, which can lead to time-space divergence, and uh, reaching a critical point where innovations take place, or where the finances catch up to the needs and requirements for constructing uh, a new system, or improving uh, an existing system. And so innovation and investment tends to, the, the acceleration between places tends to occur all of a sudden. So they cut the ribbon for the new highway or the new bridge, and suddenly places are uh, significantly closer together. And the impact of this is to sort of upset the prevailing um, uh, economic landscape in terms of the ability, the competitive abilities of different places to succeed within a settlement system. So one of the motivating factors for time-space convergence, uh, it can be argued, uh, is that each place is seeking to improve its utility, the utility of its location, by being as accessible as possible to the rest of the world, or to the places that matter to it. And, of course, places like New York and um, London and Paris and Berlin and Shanghai and, and other places are uh, seeking to achieve that uh, scale of uh, convergence at a uh, significant level to enhance their competitive capacities. So time-space convergence, this is the sort of smooth transition between Santa Barbara and Los Angeles over time from 1800 to 2050. But in this case, we're looking at slices of time by 25 years with changes in transport technology which bring Los Angeles and San Santa Barbara, normally about a 200 kilometers apart, uh, suddenly in a state of time-space convergence with interludes of time-space divergence, reflecting the congestion and uh, from traffic and the uh, deterioration of older systems that need replacement.
So that's time-space convergence. So there are some properties of the time-space convergence that we can uh, illustrate very quickly. Uh, one, temporal discontinuities. The temporal discontinuities are reflected in the sharp breaks that can occur at particular points uh, in time when new innovations succeed others. Many of these uh, transport technologies occur, of course, exist simultaneously. We still walk and ride bicycles, even though we have trains and airplanes. Uh, and so there are different modes of transportation. There are, um, there's non-uniform non shrinking going on of the world, if you will, uh, in the sense that some places are converging upon the rest of the world system faster than others. They're converging upon places within their own regions more quickly than others. And others are diverging. And this goes back and forth. Time-space inversions can occur where the uh, time distance may be less for more, for more distant places in absolute space measured by, say, kilometers or miles than it is uh, for uh, closer places. So this is particularly true, for example, with the airline hub systems. You may live fairly uh, close to uh, Berlin, uh, but uh, it's likely that um, Milan will have greater, uh, will, will have better transport connections to Berlin than will a smaller place, intervening place, that might have to travel through a, a hub location in order to reach the other point. And so time-space inversions are built into the convergence uh, process. Simultaneity of diverse convergence realms, we've men mentioned this in terms of the different modes of transportation that exist, but also in terms of socioeconomic status of individuals and firms and countries, uh, in the sense that the more resources you have uh, in terms of financial capabilities, um, the greater your opportunity to take advantage of the faster modes of transportation. And so there's a built-in class uh, bias, if you will, with respect to uh, convergence when we begin looking at the individual level or uh, implications for the uh, success of firms uh, within a, a market economy. And uh, from a scientific point of view, there are measurement uh, issues. How do we measure time-space convergence? So, for instance, rates vary with selected span of years, the time of year, the time of day, uh, could condition how long it takes to go from one place to another. Uh, the fastest time between two places uh, is one way of looking at it, but what about taking the average time over a day if there are multiple connections, let's say, with respect to public transportation. Uh, this would produce uh, a somewhat different uh, image. And the third factor here is that transport services are periodic rather than continuous. Uh, walking would be a continuous transport service. As long as you're awake and upright, you're able to walk. Uh, but it's pretty slow. If you want to go by an express train, you have to wait uh, according to the schedule uh, and join the queue to enter the train. So it's a, it's a periodic thing, it may be every hour, it may be once a day, uh, connection between one place and another. So these are just some of the complications that arise with respect to the measurement of time-space convergence. Now, up to this point, we've looked at convergence between as a two-point convergence process, one place with respect to another. The convergence curve for two places, however, is a rather limited view of the settlement system. It doesn't very well characterize the crystal landscape of southern Germany that we saw earlier. Um, and so it might be useful to think about convergence in a linear system places, such as uh, along um, highways, um, European road network, uh, 
and so on. Or it also it's useful to, to think about convergence in a multi-place settlement system. So all places converging, diverging with respect to one another across space. Uh, and this becomes in a more complicated uh, issue with respect to how we would represent this. So let's begin with a uh, hypothetical example of time-space convergence in a linear system of places with uniform transportation innovation. And so this system consists of five places, 25 kilometers apart, each five, 25 kilometers apart along the line from A to E, a total of 100 kilometers. And by uniform transportation innovation, we mean that the innovation, the improvement in the transport, uh, will be the same across this system. So in this hypothetical example, uh, measurements from place A to all of the other places, B, C, D, and E, at 50 kilometers an hour, assumed in 19, the year 1950, results in a fairly steady uh, uh, increase in the number of uh, minutes to get the E. And if we double the speed to 100 kilometers an hour by 2010, in other words, a period of 60 years, we have, uh, as we would expect, the transportation time is cut in half. So instead of 120 minutes, it's 60 minutes to travel from A to E. Now, uh, the convergence save uh, is, is indicated, or rather the minutes saved in travel as a result of the innovation is illustrated for each of the, uh, each place from place A. And so A converges upon B at a quarter of a minute per, uh, per year. Half a minute per year with place C, three quarters of a minute for place D, and a full minute for place E over 60 years. So the curve from, in the second diagram, the curve from A to E is represented by this uh, solid line going from the bottom left corner up to the upper right corner. And it's possible then to construct a convergence curve for each place within this system. So for instance, the convergence curve for place um, C, or rather place D, is uh, here is represented by uh, convergence with place B at a half a minute per year. It converges with uh, place C at a quarter of a minute per year, a half a minute per year with place D, and uh, a three quarters of a, a minute of uh, place uh, E. So, sorry, let me go back here. So this is the, and, and so each place has its own convergence curve. And if you were to assume that uh, each, you, you had a, a travel event from each place to every other place, and you calculated along in this system, linear system, the overall cumulative benefits over time would look like the curve at the bottom uh, of this uh, diagram. So the one at the bottom illustrates the cumulative benef benefits. Minutes saved per year for single independent trips from each place to all other places within the system. So, place C is obviously the closest, but the greatest degree of convergence benefits places A and E because they're, they're more distant and the the travel innovation is carried out over a significant, uh, um, the longer distance uh, than the place C, since it's already kind of close. Um, but this has this this curve has rather interesting uh, implications. It suggests that the sheer geometry of the system uh, is a factor in the convergence process. Any innovation will significantly better benefit the more distant places connected by it than will any of the intervening places. Um, and if we go back to the central place theory, 
of Cristallo, we know that big places tend to be more distant apart, on average, than smaller places. And innovations tend to accrue to large places, and they accrue to uh, uh, simply as a basis, uh, simply as a result of extending transport innovations over space, so that more distant places, large places, are likely to benefit more than uh, intervening large places. And uh, so this sort of augments the economic clout of large places within any kind of a system uh, in, uh, with regard to investments in transportation uh, improvements. So, <clears throat> that was uh, uh, looking at a linear system. But now let's look at a multi-place settlement system uh, with uh, non-uniform transport network innovations. And this is a hypothetical example that I developed uh, many years ago as part of a PhD thesis in 1966. And it simply uh, represents a the, the planimetric map here uh, at the top left uh, is simply, and, and this is in miles, um, the speed per day, 30 miles per day, 30, uh, 20 miles per day, and a trail allowing 10 miles per day movement. Uh, by 19, this was in 19, um, planimetric distance in 1980. And the t converting this then into, uh, from miles into hours. And, uh, what we see here is that because of the differential allocation of transport innovations that benefit A and E more so than other places, that uh, it becomes very difficult to represent this uh, time space in a planimetric uh, 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 mode. And uh, so what's happened here is that this ballooning out of the curve between A and D, which are much more distant apart, uh, represents uh, a warping of time space within the system. And this kind of warping goes on with respect to successive uh, innovations. So by 1850, we uh, have improved technologies, railways, stagecoaches that uh, travel somewhat faster. Uh, and you see that uh, the, the space becomes more and more complex. So that uh, introducing land travel by 1960, we have the same kind of phenomenon going on with respect to multi-lane highways, which have limited access uh, and allow for greater speeds. And uh, by 1960, throwing in air and land transportation, we see here significant convergence from A to E, which were the most distant places within the network back in, on the planimetric map back in the year 1800. Uh, resulting in um, significant warping of uh, the the lines or the links that would join places. And so the, the, the bulging out of the curve reflects um, extending it uh, in scale uh, to, to minutes as opposed to looking at the uh, more simple planimetric uh, view. So this was a rather crude attempt to look at this kind of a multi-place uh, settlement system with respect to the time-space convergence impact on the settlement system. There are various other ways of looking at uh, travel time on maps, isochrome maps, uh, lines of uh, equal uh, travel time uh, have been around for quite some time as illustrated here by travel days from Berlin. Um, by uh, Eckert uh, in uh, 1909. Um, the, and the one to the right the, is an attempt to transform uh, the space itself into a time map. Uh, and so the, 
United Kingdom here looks uh, significantly different than what we observe, but we can you know, see various things that seem to stand out and bring attention to London as a focal point of a uh, significant uh, uh, settlement uh, system. But the transformation of the space, so it's like a time shape of uh, the United Kingdom, if you will. Um, so we can look at various attempts to capture uh, transport innovation, and, and these are two more examples, one by Mark Jefferson uh, in an article called Civilizing Rails, where he constructed a buffer zone 10 miles wide to represent the expansion of railways uh, throughout Europe, uh, Europe and uh, uh, 1928, the 10 mile buffer zone from rail lines. And so the wider uh, the uh, surface, the uh, greater the uh, concentration of railways. Uh, and most places are serviced by the railways within the zones. The term civilizing rails has was not, not been well received. Uh, it's, it's seen as a, a, a perspective from a, a colonizing uh, point of view with respect to the, uh, many parts of the world. Um, but however, nonetheless, it's an interesting uh, cartographic uh, display. The one on the right, uh, Whittemore Boggs was the uh, official geographer for the U.S. State Department, uh, I believe, in most of the Roosevelt uh, administration. And uh, he was interested in trafficability in different parts of the world. And uh, what this map shows, it's a travel cost map. Uh, but it's, it's not an ISO cost map. It's, a, it's what you might call, well, it is an ISO cost map. Uh, but it, it, um, it represents the transport cost, cost per 10 mile, per ton mile, um, uh, dependent on the mode of transportation, whether it's by water, river, canal, uh, horse-drawn vehicles, uh, buffaloes, dogs, or reindeers. And so all of this is calculated out. And so within any one of these, uh, zones on the map, you have uh, transportation, which is largely associated with a given cost of travel, it's assumed to be within a zone. It's assumed to be somewhat isotropic, regardless of the uh, direction in which you're moving. However, as you will see, uh, the tra the Siberian railway here comes across rather uh, clearly uh, with regard to the um, Eurasia. So these are some other examples. So there's a significant body of uh, literature and attempts to uh, achieve different uh, I, uh, ways of displaying transport surfaces and travel time, travel costs. Uh, this one is particularly interesting. It's a cartographic transformation of Seattle by William Bungie. Uh, William Bungie uh, published a rather interesting book in 1962 called Theoretical Geography. It was part of a PhD thesis at the University of Washington, but the book itself was published uh, by the University of Lund uh, in Sweden. And he begins uh, with what's known as an isotac map. So an isotac map represents regions of equal speed. So within uh, any one of these zonal um, uh, shadings on the map, uh, you have uh, different uh, speed levels, levels. So here in the center of Seattle, you move rather slowly, and as you progress towards the edge, uh, particularly along certain linear uh, dimensions, uh, things uh, um, speed up. Uh, in, terms of, uh, in this case, distance it's miles per five minutes. Uh, by automobile for areas of the city. From an isotec map, it is possible to construct an infinite number of isochrone maps from any given point on the map. So in this case, uh, 
the, the, the example shown here under isochrome map is a line of equal travel from the University of Washington, which is located here, uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, travel time uh, as you progress out from the University of Washington. And in the third example, it's sort of like the example that we were looking at for London, we have a time scale transformation of the map where time is the uh, measure of distance and you get some modification to the shape of uh, uh, Seattle. And so there are, these are equal, equal time bands, uh, five minute concentric circles from downtown uh, Seattle. So this represents a cartographic computational approach, if you will, to looking at the transformation of space uh, as a result of alteration of uh, travel time through transport innovation. And here yet is another example uh, where the, uh, the grid itself is uh, transformed to reflect the shrinking differential shrinking of uh, Europe by Spikerman and Wagner, two um, uh, economists uh, from Germany. Uh, and so in this case, they're seeking to minimize the stress to re reconcile distances among all places over the rail network. So it's an attempt to, again, look at a multi-place shrinkage of space. You can presumably go in and do a calculation from the map to uh, determine the travel time from one place uh, to another. And uh, yet again, another example from Alain, Alain Lahostas, uh, a geographer, University of Paris, uh, who uh, combines three transport networks on a single map, a travel time map of France. So there are three networks uh, in red, uh, high-speed rail, a future high-speed speed rail, looking ahead, limited access highways uh, in blue, and general service roads in aqua. And at these junction points, it's possible to shift from uh, one mode of transportation to another. And uh, there are these triangular uh, or um, pyramid-type pyramid uh, extensions of the map that pop up to, uh, in order to capture some of the warpage of the space, if you will, of what uh, he refers to as the shrinkage of the space. And so dis distances are measured along the lines allowing transfer to alternate ne networks at junction points. Waldo Tobler, a co uh, former colleague of mine who passed away recently, uh, was probably one of the uh, most important theoretical cartographers and computational cartographers of the uh, uh, 21st uh, century. And his, he makes a number of comments in observing this uh, map by the hostess in a talk that Waldo, he, Waldo Kobler gave in 2001 called The World is Shriveling as It Shrinks. And referring to the map you see on the left, he, he says, Admittedly, measuring on this map would be difficult, but this diagram is nevertheless the most marvelous invention, conceptually and graphically. He goes on to say, With GIS technology, the Graphic Information Systems technology, one might drape the conventional map of France on top of this transportation service, and a dynamic version would pulsate. So a rather interesting view, and the hostess has carried on this line of thinking with respect to the shriveling of the United States. And in this case, combining air transportation with uh, various levels of transport technology. So long-range 600 kilometer per hour flights, short range air at 400 kilometers per hour, dual carriage highways at 100 kilometers per hour, and highways uh, at 70 kilometers uh, per hour.
So again, so th these are some of the innovative approaches that are occurring uh, with the aid of uh, researchers in various parts of the world. And uh, this is a very interesting uh, map. Oops, I got it. All right, so well, that is the background in terms of uh, multi-place convergence and divergence. I want to look at a metropolit metropolitan transportation accessibility through historical time. And I'm going to do so by looking at a, another hypothetical example to uh, correspond with the one that we looked at earlier uh, for the linear system. In this case, we're going to look at an urban area. And for background, if you were to characterize the morphology of networks or the topology of networks that service of highways that service major cities in the United States, uh, prior to the mid 1950s, it would have been sort of star shaped patterns of links merging from a, a city center going out. Uh, however, by the 19 60s, early 1960s, we began to see the emergence of higher speed, limited access highways um, uh, moving around the cities, and in some cases within cities. But by 1976, 1980, many of the cities in this country, in the United States that is, and in many other countries of the world, had already begun to achieve beltways. So circular roads around them. And so we can see a transformation in the physical morphology of the transportation networks over time. And we're going to set up a hypothetical example that replicates this and see what happens with respect to time-space convergence. And so here we have uh, the hypothetic, hypothetical case of the metropolitan system uh, from 1950 to the year 2010. In 1950, uh, it's simply basic crossroads. And the values along the links between nodes uh, represents the kilometers per hour of movement. So 30 kilometers per hour at the on the central links from the central place, which is A. Um, uh, increasing as you move out away from congested areas to 40 kilometers per hour. And by 2010, the topology and the speed limits become a little more complicated. And so we have uh, a beltway, and we have limited access highways running through the city, in this case, a uh, major city, into smaller places, uh, at 100 kilometers per hour outside of the beltway, movement 100 kilometers per hour along the beltway, uh, 80 kilometers per hour within the more densely populated area of the urban environment, uh, using the limited access highway. And uh, conventional streets uh, or roads are limited to 40 kilometers per hour within the beltway extending to 60 kilometers per hour beyond the beltway. So what we're going to be looking at here, uh, what we might call topologically equivalent points within the network, and we're going to measure the time-space convergence of each place, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H, and I, uh, to all other places within the system looking at the convergence rates between the 60-year period from 1950 to 2010. So A, in this example, is a unique place. It's at the center, and given the speeds which are illustrated on the network, and this is based on a large matrix, uh, or a small matrix, I should say, of data that, that uh, calculated the travel time from each place to every other place. Uh, A is converging the least at 0.2 minutes uh, per year, from 1950 to 1960. B and D are topologically equivalent. 
uh, in terms of travel speeds and in terms of uh, linkage uh, to the rest of the network. They're converging at an average rate of 0.42 minutes per year. C and E are also topologically equivalent and equivalent in terms of their uh, speed linkages, uh, and they are converging at 0.46 minutes per year. F and H, as we go up to the exterior here, along the slower north-south route illustrated here, um, are converging at 0.52 minutes per year. And G and I are the primary beneficiaries of the convergence process at 0.61 minutes per year. So when you look at this pattern, of, which is a multi-centered uh, pattern, um, you do see the same um, pattern that we observe when we look at the, at the linear system. That is to say, the more distant places generally benefit the most from time-space convergence process. And although the center A remains the closest to all other places within the system, other places are gaining on it uh, quite significantly uh, because of our tendency, our, our investment strategies to uh, build uh, limited access highways, to build uh, circumferential highways around our uh, major metropolitan metropolitan centers. And so the result is uh, a significant time-space benefit gain by the more distant locations. Uh, and as we observe, you know, especially here in North America, uh, but elsewhere in the world, uh, there uh, is a progressive extension of uh, urban along urban uh, agglomerate forces to the edges of our urban environments. And most of our transport innovations, or many of them, have benefited the edge more than the center. Where do we locate airports, for example? Uh, in uh, North America, there's a tendency now to begin moving railway stations from the centers to the periphery of uh, uh, cities. Uh, so there are a lot of interesting uh, uh, forces at play here, aside from time-space convergence itself. But nonetheless, it plays an important role. And in order to illustrate the implications of time-space convergence, uh, I've set up another little hypothetical situation here where we look at um, average travel time for commuting, uh, where we have different speeds of movement, from 60 kilometers per hour to 80 kilometers per hour, where you're allocating time for a one-way one daily commute trip of uh, 30 minutes. You're willing to go 30 minutes uh, per day on a, on a one-way journey to work. Uh, and as a result, you have a potential distance that you can live from the city center. Uh, in kilometers, increasing from 30 to at 60 kilometers per hour, 35 kilometers at 70 kilometers per hour, 40 at 80 kilometers per hour. And if you're willing to increase the amount of your commute time to 30 to 50 minutes, you could live 67 kilometers away uh, within your uh, time uh, threshold. And the implication of this in terms of the land resource is quite phenomenal in its, uh, its uh, your, your simple pi r square, and uh, it expands in this case from uh, about 2,800 square kilometers to over 5,000 square kilometers of accessible land at 80 kilometers per hour at 30 uh, at a movement uh, over 30 movement moving at over 30 minutes. Uh, on an average commute. Uh, if you're willing to travel more, uh, a lot more time for travel, you could increase this quite dramatically to, in this case, 14,000 square kilometers. So this ha has implications with respect to where you live or where you might want to live 
the kinds of environment that you might seek uh, to live in. So this is just one simple illustration of an implication of the time-space convergence process on everyday behavior that people make in choosing a place to live, choosing where to work with respect to where you live, uh, and so on. So, what are some of the implications for time-space convergence that result from uh, this process? Uh, the status of the place within urban settlement systems. We can argue that each place within an urban settlement system is seeking to improve its accessibility to all other places uh, as much as possible. And this is a competitive uh, process uh, where cities seek to uh, encourage investments which advance their ability to reach the rest of the global system. Uh, it has implications with respect to the market reach of firms within regional and national economies and how uh, industry and business grows and services larger and larger areas. Uh, it means very often that larger metropolitan centers can um, uh, sort of take over the more local economies that had developed under previous uh, technologies. Uh, and this extends into, to economic competitiveness uh, with respect to the global economy. I refer back to the uh, convergence by railways uh, in terms of passenger railways that we looked at earlier uh, with the uh, extensive investments that China has made uh, in recent uh, years. It may also, as a result, have an impact on other things, such as how ideas spread uh, or the spread of communicable uh, diseases and how rapidly they be, be, may extend themselves uh, over the uh, global area. Uh, as we look um, more locally at the land development within a metropolitan region, we illustrated uh, that with our hypothetical example of uh, uh, implications for land development, the choices of where people live and work, the commuting patterns and traffic issues that might ensue as a result of that. So it has a, a rather broad impact on a number of the things that uh, challenge us as a society. And uh, speaking of challenges, uh, we also have challenges in terms of dealing with cost and time space distance measures, how to, how to actually measure them, uh, how to embed these uh, measures in research designs for visualization of human settlement systems in this case, how to operationalize convergent processes within the traditions of geography, spatial analysis, geographic information systems, and geographic information science, and science generally. Uh, and how to enhance cartographic visualization of multi-network settlement systems with comprehensible representations of what these shorter spaces. So these are important uh, challenges that uh, uh, impact not only work in geography, but computer sciences, computer graphics, um, and a, uh, a number of uh, display technologies. Some of the debates that uh, we could have with respect to the presentation on settlement systems is, and on applications of um, concepts from physics, uh, for example, velocity, which time-space convergence is derived from, is a, are they appropriate? Are they acceptable for understanding the settlement landscape trans transitions? And within the social sciences, there's indeed significant debate about borrowing uh, concepts from other disciplines, such as physics, and applying them to understanding of human behavior and this human decision making. Uh, so these are areas of significant debate that we're, we're having. Uh, is time-space convergence at the Earth scale a real process or an artifact of measurement? Uh, and I would argue that uh, time-space convergence is an artifact of measurement. It's a human conception of Earth space uh, with respect to human interests. Uh, because there's always been 
uh, a humanistic interest in being close to others. Uh, and um, we've always sort of sort of expressed over many, many centuries, we've expressed the idea of, of a shrieking world. And uh, some of uh, this concept of time-space convergence allows one to actually uh, make a stab at measuring. Uh, but how valid is it? And then finally, how might, how do uh, the internet, online social networks, e-commerce, globalization, alter the role of human behavior uh, and in uh, settlement landscape uh, organization. So these are the primary issues that I would leave with you in this uh, presentation. I want to thank you for your uh, attention today and uh, invite you to take a look at some of the uh, references that are cited in this presentation and also invest investigate some of the other uh, references here on uh, time space in the discipline uh, of geography. And so with that, uh, thank you again very much. It's been uh, fun being part of this uh, debate. Thank you. That was, uh, that was an extremely interesting presentation. I have seen similar diagrams of pound distributions in a hexagonal um, map of China, looking at market towns and so forth, the same kind of hierarchical sets of towns. And I've seen stuff on how to use like general relativistic type concepts to do mapping of economic and human activity, although I would agree that we don't really have a satisfactory way of doing it. So I found that very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Well, there in, uh, in China, um, there was a, a lot of very interesting research done by, uh, I believe it was Singer, um, back in the 1950s, looking at periodic marketing systems, which have, these are markets which travel. It's like your farmer's market, which meets at a different location at different times of the day. And uh, 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 in, in China, the, these were traditional, and, and I believe still are, traditional uh, kinds of uh, marketing systems that are quite, quite prominent. I have a question. This is Tony. Uh, it looks like it's it's a uh, it's almost looks like Zip's law. Is that some? Is it in there somewhere? I'm sorry. I, I think I'm breaking up. Um, hold on. I'm going to. I was wondering if it's, it looks like there's a it's a version of Zip's law. Is Zip's law oh. in any of that data? Uh yeah. Zip Zip's law is sort of like a power function, I believe. That uh, ranks uh, cities according to size and uh, a rank order distribution of places. And yeah, the um, the central place system um, would uh, conform to Zip's law in the in the sense that there would be many many more small places than very big places. That's correct. The twenty eighty rule. <laughs> Pardon? Uh, Zip's law, the twenty eighty rule. There's a, there's there's a lot more little ones than an, I mean, it's a lot yeah. more little ones than there are big ones. Yes, 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 yes. That that is the case. Okay. I, I found your talk to be very fascinating, especially now that I can understand. So, wait a minute. Your your data infers that the traffic here in Washington D.C. is going to get worse over the years. <laughs> uh um. Well, it. it it depends. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot to it. I mean, uh, uh, Elon Musk uh, will uh, build a tunnel and a few tunnels here and there and, and uh, resolve this problem, problem for us. I <laughs> well, thank you so much for your talk. I found it very, very fascinating. Thank you. There's also an implication here that you might get a more cost-effective improvement in transportation systems by spending a bit more time looking at center city uh, transportation, like um, walkways and so forth, like you have in airports very frequently. Yes, um, yes, I mean, um, 
being able to exploit all modes of transportation because sometimes walking or walkways uh, may be uh, more feasible in terms of uh, managing uh, uh, timely connections than uh, more high-speed kinds of uh, uh, transport uh, facilities. Yes, I think that I think that is a case worth looking into. I think with the the space-time convergence um, idea, is is does that mean that faster travel times generates more closely knitted hubs of um, social development? Um. Uh, yes. Um, I, I'm sorry. When you say, did you say use the word hub? Yeah. Okay. Social what hub. What do you mean by um, that? Well, as as the as the time it takes for people to um to link with one another, as that reduces, um, instinctively they just bunch together more. Um. Well, in terms of uh, travel time, yes, that it, that that might be the case. It, it would it would definitely encourage greater agglomeration at the center that uh, where you have access to the greatest speed. Now, this gets offset in part by information and communication technologies uh, in the current era, when we can uh, substitute uh, uh, virtual. Uh, connections such as our conference today yeah, yeah. Uh, to um, affect uh, exchanges and I have another I have another concept that is a parallel it's almost a dual of time space convergence and that is uh, the concept of human extensibility and human extensibility takes advantage of time space convergence technologies to allow a person from a particular place to access other places without moving. And that's what we're doing today. We, we've extended our locations from Australia to uh, Pennsylvania to uh, uh, Vasa to... Um... <laughs> okay, great. Thank you yeah, very I much. Wish I I, w I wish I could answer that in more detail, but uh, I really yeah. <laughs> don't know. <laughs> sure, NASA's looking into it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Don, for your very interesting lecture. Thank you.